Hello, you're watching Talking Europe. The EU says that science is the key to its future, but is it putting its money where its mouth is? Earlier this year, the French government agreed to cuts in the country's research budget, and over the past year, science powerhouses such as Germany, Italy, and the Netherlands have proposed or implemented cuts in research. This as EU member states grapple with their public deficits. Those working in universities and research centers say there's a stark gap between the reality and the way the EU is presenting itself as a magnet for global talent. This is how the French government and the European Commission pitched their Choose Europe for Science conference in Paris in early May. To make Europe more attractive, the EU executive says a 500 million euro package will be proposed for the 2025 to 27 period. Part of that outreach is aimed at American research whose work is being jeopardized by the, Trump's, by the Trump administration's cuts. Well, to discuss all this, I'm joined by German MEP Martin Schirdewan, who is co-chair of the Left Group. Welcome to you. Thank you. Joined also by Latvian MEP Ivar Zijabs, who is a bureau member of the Renew Europe Group. Welcome to you as well. Um, Let's first take a quick listen to the EU Commissioner for Tech Sovereignty, Henna Virkonen, talking about the attractiveness of Europe. Uh, she spoke to this program a few, days, a few days ago. Let's take a listen. I see that there's a lot of interest towards European Union when it's about students or researchers or also industry, startups, companies, because in this time when there's so much uncertainty in the global scale, Europe is seen as a very uh, reliable and stable place. Uh, Martin Schirdewan, so is that true? Europe is stable and reliable compared to, uh, uh, let's say, a scientist working in the US now, perhaps? <clears throat> well, I would say yes. Uh, it seems to be stable and reliable compared to what is going on in the United States. I would say that um, the U.S. administration under Donald Trump has started to wage a war on science. And this uh, is something that is related to the elite's war on democracy that is going to happen there or that is happening right now there. Because if you have a closer look at the administration, then it consists of oligarchs, super rich oligarchs and the extreme right in the U.S. And of course, critical science, research and development is always an obstacle for a let's say, elite that wants to turn a democracy into an authoritarian state. And this is what going, it's going on there. And this provides us with an opportunity to attract scientists and academics to Europe. So what Trump is doing on science and research, Ivar Ziyab, it's part of a bigger picture. Well, uh, I would be looking at this uh, element also from the perspective of European competitiveness. Europe has been losing its brains during the last 10 to 15 years, without any doubt. And this is probably one of mm -hmm. the opportunities to get those people back uh, in terms of uh, competitiveness. Of course, we really need the world-class mm -hmm. research and innovation. The problem is, of course, that the EU has limited resources and also that single market for innovation, where mm -hmm. uh, Leta was talking about, is still very much somewhere in the future. It doesn't mm -hmm. exist. In that sense, I think that, well, this is an opportunity. Uh, okay. I think this is the right way to go. The problem is that whether we can accomplish something. Yeah, I mean, it's good that you mentioned the brain drain, but if we look at some statistics, Martin Schirdewan, just after this Choose Europe for Science conference was launched in France, yeah. a group of trade unions issued a statement saying, welcoming international researchers, who are we kidding? And it notes that half of temporary teaching assistants uh, are paid below the minimum wage. Many are getting paid with months in delay, and 35% of staff in this sector have precarious contracts. So yeah. th we're looking at uh, the reality of austerity here. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. this is, as you say, the bitter reality, and this bitter reality has been created by the rules that the European Union has given itself when it comes to financial spending, when it comes to the economic framework, and that narrows down to a policy of austerity, and that we, of course, can also see by, let's say, the underfunding of our university, the underfunding of European research and development, but also, as you said, in the day-to-day -day salary balance sheets that uh, yeah. our 
education personnel, but also our scientists at the universities see every day. And they don't have just they don't just have enough money in their pockets. Mm -hmm. And that's why I have serious doubts that we will achieve what you said that we will actually achieve to attract foreign brain that we that we uh, really need here in the European Union in order to establish, let's say, an internal market of science, of critical science, of research and development that is competitive with other world regions. But we are far, far away from that due to austerity. Well, uh, let me say a couple of words from my own perspective, which is Latvian. Latvia is one of the countries that are still below the average in terms of R&I. And the problem is right now is that the European money is there, those 500 millions you just mentioned by the Choose Europe initiative. But the problem is that uh, richer member states are investing more in their own domestic programs, which would basically lead to the situation that this willingness to attract American researchers would just increase those disparities among the countries, which is also an issue. And this is where we really see the role of the EU to be invested much more in this type of approach. If we take this idea of European research area seriously. Yeah. So maybe as an antidote to having this these disparities with each country financing at a different level. One, one answer, Martin Schervan, and some researchers in France have put this forward, is the idea of a real European research fund, a pan-European fund, with the kind of money that might perhaps rival, you know, these massive endowments at Yale and Princeton and, uh, you know, Harvard and so on. But I guess we're still very far from that in reality. We are <laughs> very, very far from that, unfortunately. Yeah. But I see the need to invest massively into our educational system in the European Union. I mean, this is what uh, we are discussing here and what is at stake the future of the European Union. And yeah. since the US is not a reliable partner anymore, and the transatlantic partnership is damaged, is seriously damaged, mm. we need to discuss strategic autonomy. And strategic autonomy, of course, includes the idea of a strategic autonomous research and development sector, critical science that is that is properly funded and therefore we would, might need mm. such kind of a fund here. Yeah. yeah, and of course, you know, there is this plan now to spend 800 billion euros on defense. Uh, it's been estimated that if Europe spent just an eighth of that on a European uh, science and innovation fund, that would make a big difference. I actually see these both things as complementary and mm. not as a real choose one of them. Right. And in that sense, of course, well, I think uh, we shouldn't uh, make this a position because defense is a necessity taking into account the Russian war of aggression in Ukraine and all the general threat it is posing to the EU. But the problem with our R&I system is that it is much less competitive than the American one. And mm -hmm. as for Trump's situation, well, let's see what happens. Because mm -hmm. we, as you just said, Trump is very much unpredictable in many ways. He can just make a U-turn in that policy in a half a year. But at the same time, what we should really think about, this is very much investment in our own uh, research and innovation system, including also private money, because European researchers very much rely on public grants, which mm. do not lead to real innovations in a commercial scale. D does the private sector have an incentive, though, to get involved in the way that some are arguing for? But I had the impression that, for instance, the European car industry uh, was uh, hibernating in the last decade. So they actually missed the technological process of innovation. And now they have that issue that they are not com competitive anymore compared to, for instance, Asian uh, mm -hmm. car in this, in, 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 in enterprises. So that, that actually is a problem. So there is, of course, an incentive for them to invest. But still, I guess that we need a sector of technological development that is under public supervision because what we cannot let's say allow ourselves is that we uh, fall into the same trap as the US did mm -hmm. that now you have big tech companies that are running the economy that are running politics that are more or less in charge of also technological processes and uh, innovation when it comes to military etc so this is something that we urgently need to avoid mm -hmm. so I would argue for 
public supervision and public ownership when it comes to technological uh, innovation? Probably not your position. <laughs> well, in terms of public, uh, of course, there, there are, for example, in terms of uh, fundamental science and in terms of uh, investment in the research infrastructure. I think the public money plays a huge role, including European money, by the way. But at the same time, I think that what we really should look to is, of course, the practice of venture capital, all those things that really have made the, the US such a research powerhouse. Because there is a place for public money, without any doubt, including, of course, universities that are really, judged, and in that I completely agree with the colleagues, they have been really underfunded during the last period. Yeah. Do, do you think there's much we can still do, though, even having so fewer resources than the US in terms of finishing or perhaps boosting the single market or trying to create this single European uh, science space, all these things that these reports have talked about, right? The letter report, the Draghi report and so on. We have to, I guess, implement those things first. Yes, well, both reports were advocating for a major change in how money is spent in the European Union. And I think that the European Commission really needs to ramp up its game there. <laughs> they didn't do that yet, but we need to spend and invest Obviously. Yeah. yeah. We'll end it there. Thank you so much for this discussion, Ivars Iyavs and Martin Shirovan. Uh, glad you could join us for this episode of Talking Europe. Do stay with us here. More news coming up on France 24.